Hello everybody, and welcome to Tomorrow and Still. That's the first and only time I'll say welcome, because every time from now on is going to be welcome back. So, I thought it would only be fitting for the inaugural video of this channel to be focused around William Faulkner, because this channel will be talking a lot about William Faulkner. The channel is titled around William Faulkner. So, I decided, hey, this is the first video, let's make it about Faulkner. So for those that might not know, I am on a quest to read, rank, and review every one of his novels. And he is by far my favorite author of all time. And so I kind of got obsessed with his works. I found one of his books that my mom read, and then I read it, and then I fell in love. Um, so yeah, now I have read a lot of his books. So when I was recording my last video, I actually realized that I have read over half of his novels. I have read 10 out of 19. Um, and so I realized, hey, eventually I'm going to get around to ranking all of his books against each other when I read all of them and making that a video. But why not, when I'm halfway through, rank half of his b books against each other? So that's what we're going to do today. So I have 10, the 10 bo books of his I have read right here. Um, and so I'm going to rank them um, from bottom to top, give you my reasonings. Um, and talk about the book a little bit, and then, yeah, we'll go from there. So, let's get started. So, the, before I get into the first book in this list, I'm, I have to preface that I love all of these books. There's a reason why Faulkner is my favorite author of all time. The lowest book, I gave a three, a three stars, flat, which is really good. To me, that means it was a good book. I read it, I enjoyed it. Nothing big about it, though. That's the, that's the least I have rated William Faulkner. So that's saying a lot. So before we get into that, I'm none of these bottom books are bad. They're all really good, just some are worse than others. So coming in at the bottom is The Unvanquished. The Unvanquished is weird because it is a collection of short stories. Um, or at least it was originally published as a collection of short stories, except they're all co like they're all connected around this one boy named Bayard Sartoris. So Bayard Sartorius is the son of Colonel John Sartorius, um, who is kind of the like genesis of like, or is like the center or like the origin of Yoknapatalfa County. For those that don't know, Yoknapatalfa County is kind of Faulkner's shared universe of a lot of his books. And so Sartorius, Colonel, Colonel Sartorius is kind of what started the history of Yoknapatalfa, kind of. So Bayard is the son of him or grandson, I forget. And so this book follows his family doing various kinds of things while um, the colonel has gone off doing things post-Civil War because the colonel was so obsessed with, um, with the South that he, even when the war was over, it wasn't for him. So he kept doing like revolutionary stuff. And so he was pretty much just an extremist, but that's besides the point. He's gone in this book, thank God. Um, so we just kind of follow uh, Bayard in his family and his um, friend slash black servant, Ringo, as they kind of bebop around Jefferson and Yoknam Patalfa and do different things. The only problem I have with this book is it leans really heavily into stream of consciousness, which I am not the biggest fan of. I like it when Faulkner does stream of consciousness, don't get me wrong, I love the sound of the theory, but this book does it a little bit too hard, I guess, or is like trying to be Ulysses too much or something along those lines. It just felt really weird and really unnatural and really clunky. And I didn't like how it was written and Bayard's a bit of a dumbass. And just the story isn't interesting. It's just a bunch of people just kind of, I don't know. I even like, I, I forget what it was because it was just boring. I forget what, it, what this book was about because it was just for the most part boring. I did not like this book as much as a lot of others. I still read it. I still finished it. Um, I think the, the first chapter and the last chapter are fantastic. Um, Ambuscade is about um, Bayard and Ringo when they were mo like pretty young where they find a gun and then almost accidentally shoot a guy um and Ringo takes the blame for it and it's actually a really cool exploration of like the racial dynamics between the two boys and that's set up for a lot of conflict later on in the book but I just think the book is just boring after that I don't know why so yeah that's why I put the unvanquished down at the bottom second to worst 
is, surprisingly, Sanctuary. This book is kind of written in, in an opposite, like, a, a style that contrasts the Unvanquished. It's, these are kind of the opposite, where this is like super stream of consciousness and super experimental and just like, you know, hard to read. This book is super easy to read, but also, I think I hated it so much because I've, I, this was a really recent read for me. I have read a lot of his other books and I know what Faulkner can do after reading this book. And so I think that's the big problem I had with it is because it, it, the writing style was just so boring compared to what else Faulkner can do. And I know Faulkner can write so much better than this. You can tell that this book was written purely to be sold, which, you know, a guy's got to make money, but also it's just not interesting. And I, I also have more gripes with this book because this book is about things in trigger warnings for a, a variety of, you know, sexual abuse. But um, so the main character, or a character in this book, the main conflict of this book is the fact that a girl named Temple Drake gets raped. It's terrifying and when you first start reading this book, you you think that, oh, Faulkner is going to make write this book about Temple. It's all going to be about Temple and her, her trauma and how she responds to having something so awful happen to her. Um, and f for a bit, yeah, it is about that. She uh, takes sanctuary in a uh, in a, um, a prostitute house run by Miss Reba in Memphis. Um, but then, after that, it starts talking about the lawyer that's trying to sue the guy, guys that raped her, and now it's all about the men. And it stops being about Temple for a very large portion of the book. And that's the problem I have with this book, is. It was lining up to be a great exploration of, like, just that, but no, it wasn't. It, it turned out to be all about the men, and it was so awful, and it could have been a great feminist novel, but nope, it wasn't. So we are going to put it right above The Unvanquished. From here on out, all the books, I don't have any, like, negatives about. They're all positives. It's just some are better than others, which is saying a lot because I had two negatives. <laughs> yeah, that's saying a lot. So let's get into the rest of the books. So next up on the list is A Soldier's Pay. So this book looks different along with Mosquitoes because um, these were first published by Boney and Liverlight back in um, the 20s. After, after those two books, um, Faulkner brought his publishing business elsewhere. And eventually, Random House got hold of all of his books except for Soldiers Pay and Mosquitoes, which um, Boney Liverlight still publish today, Liverlight Classics. So that's why these look different. They're different publishers. Soldiers Pay specifically is actually a really neat book because, especially for his first novel ever, because it has some really like unique and contrarian themes. So this is a war novel. So this takes place right after World War One. Um, a bunch of soldiers are coming home from World War One. The the book mostly centers around this one family who had a son who was set to marry and all that stuff, and then he comes home with his face completely misshapen and deformed from injuries due to war. What Fulner decided to do with this book was instead of making this book purely about the soldiers, because a lot of war novels are about the soldiers and the trauma and all that stuff and the hell that they go through, right? Instead of making this book about the soldier and his, you know, trauma, they make he makes it more about the family around around the soldier. And like Unlike Sanctuary, where this should have been about Temple, but it wasn't, it was about everybody else. Like, uh, unlike this, this actually has a lot to say by exploring the impact of everybody else. Because, like, when w war is such, like, an awful, horrific thing, and it upturns people's lives like nothing else. Not just soldiers, but the families of those soldiers, and the families that are living in countries affected by war. So it's a really interesting thing to explore how the family has to cope and deal with having a son come home horribly injured and pretty much unable to partake in society anymore. 
And so they grapple, they, 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 they try and cope and they argue about this over the course of the novel. And it's really, really interesting. And, you know, I, I think it was really well done. I, I, I do think that this book could have been a little bit shorter, but all things told for being a first novel, really solid. Next up on the list is Faulkner's second book, Mosquitoes. So this book is quite a bit longer, about 150 pages longer than Soldier's Pay. And for all intents and purposes, nothing happens in this book. And that's why it works. <laughs> okay, so it, it's probably a controversial take to say that this book works. But this book is one of those books that just doesn't necessarily have a plot. It's just kind of... Oh, it's so hard. Okay, I, I, I usually when I describe books, I describe like my thoughts and the themes and all that stuff before telling you what it's about. But I have to tell you what this book is about first, because my God. So this book is about a, a collection of socialites and artists that hop on a boat in New Orleans um, and kind of sail around for a few days. Uh, how many days is it? Four days. Um, they hop on a boat and just cruise around for four days. But the, the thing is, is that this book is kind of a critique and a satire of the artists and the socialites of New Orleans. Um, Faulkner had been living or had lived for in New Orleans for a while when he was living in New Orleans when he wrote Soldier's Pay. Um, I don't know where he was living when he finished this book, but he really did not like the, the, the culture of those kinds of people in New Orleans. So he wrote this book, giving them shit. And it's so funny. It is actually kind of a comedic book if you can see through the really dense old satire, because this was written in the 1920s. So it's it's just really funny. I, I, I enjoy this book so much because it's so fun. You just have to have fun with it. You, you have to know what to expect coming into this book because it's just, like I said, nothing happens in it. It's just a bunch of people getting stuck on a boat for four days. But like the, the situations that occur due to them getting stuck on the boat is absurd. Like for example, um, the reason why they get stuck on a boat is because they, they run aground in a really shallow part of the lake. Um, and they, that happens because the boat lost steering. And the reason the boat lost steering was because a guy, one, one of the guys, I think it's Talia, Talia Farrow or somebody, comes across a really nice piece of metal on the boat that would work perfectly for his statue that he's working on right now. And believe it or not, that was the, the steering shaft <laughs> of the boat. So the boat lost steering and ran aground because a dude thought it would be good for art. It's really funny. It's absurd. It's satirical. And I love I, I love this book for that. So right there. Next up on the list is The Reavers. So this book won Faulkner a Pulitzer Prize. Um, it, it was his second Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, do I think this book deserved a Pulitzer Prize? Eh. Probably not, but do I think it was a good book? Yes, I enjoyed it. So like Mosquitoes, this book is very lighthearted in its tone and all that stuff. Um, But this it's interesting because Mosquitoes was very early on in his career. This was his last book he ever published before he died. And it's very interesting to see how Faulkner approached lighthearted stories between the start of his career and his last book at the end of his career 40 years later. So this book is about uh, Lucius Priest and Boone Hagenbeck. So Boone Hagenbeck is the uh, black servant of the priest's family. Um, and Lucius Priest is the son of the um, the boss is what they call him. Lucius is like 12-ish at the time of this book. And so Boone decides he wants to go to Memphis. And so he talks Lucius into helping him steal Lucius's father's car, probably one of the first that existed in Jefferson. Um, and take it down to Memphis. So they do that, but then like a day into the drive, they discovered that Nen McCaslin, um, a white, very trashy guy who's, you know, he's one of those guys that's very clever, but really dumb, like that kind of stereotype of the American South. He hitched a ride in the back um, and they didn't realize that until like a day in. So um, he, they're stuck with him for the entire ride. It's kind of, it's, it, it follows in the line of mosquitoes of being really absurd because like the, the entire plot of the book, right, is they arrive in Memphis and then Ned has this great idea of, oh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sell the car that we just got here with, use the money to buy a horse that has never won a race before, enter it in a race, get it to win the race, 
win all the money, buy the car back, sell the horse again, run away the, with the profits. That is, his, that is his plan. It is really dumb. And because of that, and the fact that everybody just kind of goes with Ned's shit, it makes this book really funny and lighthearted. But also, this book is kind of, instead of a book that dwells on the past like a lot of other works by Faulkner, this book is kind of a look into the future. And the symbol of that in this is the car that they get here with. The car that they get to Memphis with is one of, if not the first car that Jefferson had seen. And so through that, the 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 book has a lot to say about where society is heading because the American South kind of, you know, was shit after the Civil War because they lost like their entire economy when slavery was abolished. A lot of what Faulkner wrote about was the South kind of trying to recover from that and trying to figure out who they were as a, as a, like a, as a region of this great nation. Faulkner was like super stuck in that mindset. So he decided, and he ended up writing this, which is such, it, yes, is a look back because this entire frame story is Lucius telling his grandsons um, the story of how he reeved a car and, you know, got into a horse race and stuff. But it's, it, while it's also being a look back, it's kind of a look into the future of, this is what society was and this is where it was going 60-ish years ago now it's so much better now or this is where it was going and the younger generations are so much are doing so much great with their part in the world and all this stuff and so it's kind of a very hopeful book it's also really funny miss reba is in it from sanctuary she in this book becomes kind of the girl boss of all girl bosses and she's so funny and there's a line here that makes me crack up when she realize, realizes that she's kind of roped into this plan of the horse race um, and she's like oh god damn it and she, but she goes along with it it's so funny I love this book yeah next up are all five stars all of the books following are five stars which is saying a lot because the, these are a lot of five stars but they're all phenomenal pieces of literature so so next up is the sound of the fury i actually reread this book this is the only book in this entire list that i've read twice for better or for worse but um i i am taking a global contemporary literature class and so this was our modernist piece that we decided to look at and my god i had a blast reading this book more than anybody else in that class probably because this book is so good <laughs> so this um, this modernist piece is the tale of the Compson family, and they once were a really rich part of the Southern aristocracy. They were, they had a lot of money, they owned a lot of land, they had so much power in Jefferson. Um, but when the book opens, they don't have that anymore. Their big old pasture is now a golf course. Um, the, the matriarch of the family is a super hypochondriac that thinks she's going to die any day, even though her health is fine and all of these things. And so this book is kind of about how they got there. How did they ended up in that really awful situation? It, it, it's a really sweeping look at this family's history in, but like it's done really interestingly because it, it, you, you get a really wide view of this family, but from very specific points of view. And so you have to put a lot of stuff together to like get the, like, it, it's a very big puzzle, but very, very, very small puzzle pieces. And you have to like really work to put the entire picture together. So the downfall of this family pretty much starts with the kids of Caroline Bascom, who marries into the family. Um, and has four kids. So the youngest is Benji, who is very heavily mentally handicapped. Um, and that's interesting because he uh, open his narration opens the book. For the first 80 page pages, you are reading the narration of a of a man that does not understand how time works. He doesn't. His mind doesn't have a sense of time. So everything just kind of melds together. All of these different time periods and scenes just kind of meld together through like the very obscure association between the two scenes. Second youngest is Jason, who is just a jackass. Um, next is Caddy, who is the only girl of the of the four uh, Bascom children. Because she's a woman, you know, the entire family wants her to fall in line with society and her, you know, the expectations of her. But she does not want to do that. And so she ends up, you know, um, doing things like sleeping with a man that she's not intending to marry and 
even worse, having his kid. Um, <laughs> and so she kind of becomes the symbol of disgrace for the family. She's shunned from the family. Um, and then the oldest of the family is Quentin Compson, who is actually featured in another one of these books. But um, Quentin um, is depressed. <laughs> so, you, you know, we got the, the, the very heavily mentally handicapped. We have the, the egoist. We've got the, um, the rebel. And then we've got the depressed. Four flavors of mentally unwell. And so you, we, we kind of explore how each of these people, you know, each of these really well-built characters kind of take part in how, why the family fell from grace. Because nobody actually does anything wrong. It's everything around them that causes everything to go wrong. Because in, in like in all fairness, none of the characters actually like Yes, they have problems, they have flaws, they're humans, but uh, maybe aside from Jason, nobody actually does anything that would that should cause a family to fall apart. It's just because the family is so fragile and so obsessed with their with their image that when these kids are born and don't want to go with the flow and don't want to be Compsons, that's when everything falls apart or can't be Compsons in Benji's case. That's when everything falls apart. And it's it's super interesting and well-written because th there, it's four chapters, three of which are from specific characters' point of view. Um, the first is Benji, second is Quentin's, third is Jason's, and the fourth is um, a third person that follows Dilsey, who is the um, black servant of the family, who is a descendant of the family slaves when that was a thing. It's really interesting because the, the book is about the downfall and because of the societal pressures put on these people. Dilsey is here to show that that didn't have to happen. Dilsey accepts Benji for being Benji. He is a human. He's just not built the same way as them. So she accepts them, uh, accepts him as that. She, um, she thinks that Quentin sh or that um, Caddy should still be a part of the family and cares for her daughter. Um, that they that Caddy sent to live with them. Dilsey really regrets what happened to Quentin, who spoiler warning killed himself. Um, she really regrets what happened to him, and the fact. But she also saw that that didn't have to happen either, um, and she understands why that happened. And she sees Jason as just the kid that really nobody paid attention to, and that's why he's such a jackass. And it's 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 so interesting. I, I love this book. I could talk for ages about this, about the things that are done with this book and the stream of consciousness and all that. I love this book so much. It's right here. Next up on the list is Absalom Absalom. So I would have to say, um, for for the longest time, I was adamant that this was the hardest Faulkner novel. For, for a while, it was the hardest book I had ever read until I read a fable, but we'll get to that. And the reason why this book is so hard is because its writing style is can be summed up in the idea that I think Faulkner forgot what a sentence was in this book. Uh, so the, the, the sentences in this book are long and sprawling and just never, ever end. And because of that, the paragraphs are also very, very long and the text is very small too. That's all one paragraph. And that makes this book kind of hard to read. But also it goes, it leans into what this book is trying to say, which is the fact that legacy and the stories you tell about people are never going to translate perfectly through the generations, right? It's, it's legacy and stories are just one big game of telephone where information is always lost. And you can't trust your mind to perfectly recall every detail of a really long and complex story. That's what this book is. This book is the entire story of um, Thomas Sutpen, who um, kind of showed up in Jefferson, Mississippi in the 1830s, bought 100 acres of land with money that he stole from the natives, um, and then, you know, built his empire with slaves and cotton and all that stuff. It follows the construction of that empire and the fall of it um, as a symbol for, you know, the South, as most of this is. 
But what's so interesting about Falk about Sutpin compared to the Compsons is that Sutpin's story is told almost entirely through hearsay. Um, so pretty much in the first chapter, Miss Caldfield is sitting in an office with Quentin Compson, um, who is about to go to Harvard. But before he goes to Harvard, she and other people of Jefferson want to tell him the story of Thomas Sutpin. And so he's tasked with going around, asking people about Sutpin, about his story, and kind of recording it. So yeah, a lot of the story is all hearsay. There are entire chapters which are just quotations. Like, sometimes you're for, you are so deep in a story that you forget that this book is technically narrated, narrated in the third person. But because of that, because this book is about, is, is told in the way of entirely through hearsay, there are contradictions in the story. There are details that are completely missing in the story. There are so many things about Sutpin and his whole debacle that really don't make sense or are hard to decode or like there are a lot of events that are never mentioned directly but you have to kind of put two and two together to connect them and kind of what that does is that forces your brain to or it, that kind of makes it impossible for your brain to make a complete puzzle and it forces you to fill in holes that um kind of make your memory of this book and of Sutpin's story imperfect um, so everybody's recollection of this book is going to be imperfect or is going to become just very, very bad because of how, one, how it's written, and two, how the bad the people are telling Sutpen's story. Um, I, I, think my, I think my favorite aspect of this book, I think my favorite story about this book, that kind of is a perfect microcosm of what this book is trying to do, is Faulkner was giving a lecture to a, a to a class in, um, I forget where, but he was giving a lecture. And so one of his students or somebody, maybe he was a journalist, I don't, I forget. Somebody asked him about, uh, asked him a question about Absalom Absalom. And his response to that question was, I don't know. I don't remember anything about that book. And then he moved on because that's what this book is about. You don't remember anything that happens in this book. You just kind of remember the vibes. And it's, it's, it's really cool. I, it's also beautifully written. Oh my God. Next up um, is the start of the top three books. So my next book, and probably my most controversial choice in this entire list, is A Fable. So why am I putting this book at number three? Well, it's not. It's definitely not because it's his first Pulitzer Prize winner and one of the reasons why he won his Nobel Prize. I'm putting this here because I think this is the most intellectually complex book and the most beautifully written book that Faulkner ever published. This is a gorgeous book, and there's a lot going on. This is his longest novel, too. Um, it's just under 500 pages, and it's a lot. It is very complex. There's so much going on in this book, and th because there's so much going on, Faulkner has a lot to say about humanity and everything going on with our world that applies to World War One and World War, eventually World War II. Um, it's just... It's so much wider in scope than anything else Faulkner ever wrote. Faulkner was very obsessed with the American South, but in this book, he kind of expanded his scope to all of humanity. And I think that's why this part of the reason why this book is so beautiful. Um, also, it is written in the most gorgeous prose I have ever read. Oh my God. Before, before I get into that. So this book is set in World War I in the trenches of France. The, the the plot is kind of all over the place, but in general, the book centers around a regiment of French soldiers that lay down their arms for a day and just kind of cause chaos. Because when they lay down arms, the rest of the French army lay down arms, and then everybody else lays down arms. Which, you know, causes people to panic because they're supposed to be fighting. They're not fighting. The generals don't know what the fuck to do. Um... And so it's really cool. So it's an allegory retelling of Holy Week of Jesus's, you know, death, sacrifice and reincarnation. Um, so this book fittingly takes place over a week. A, a lot of the reason why this book's plot is so hard to decode sometimes is because of how this book is structured. So chapter one is Wednesday, starting in the middle of the week. Okay. 
But then the second chapter is Monday, Monday night. Okay, so we're going back in time. All right, makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. Then chapter three is Tuesday night. Okay, we're, we're moving back up. You would think chapter four is Wednesday again. No, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So the, <laughs> this book kind of loops over and over and over again, covering the same period of time, but from different camera angles. It loops around all over the place, and that's part of the reason why it's so hard to decode. But also, um, you know, you have a lot of sub stories and asides. There's an entire like 80 page passage where this dude tells um, a character the time he stole a horse in at like Absalom Absalom style. It's just like 80 pages of just a story told to a guy and granted it's cool because the story is like a is like kind of mirrors the rest of the book but it's also very jarring but it's it it's so gorgeously written it's easy to get lost in the prose like let, let me just read you the opening paragraph of this book wednesday long before the first bugle sounded from the barracks within the city and the cantonments surrounding it most of the city was already awake these did not need to rise from the straw mattresses and thin pallet beds of their hive-dense tenements, because few of them, save the children, had ever lined down. Instead, they had huddled all night in one vast, tongueless brotherhood of dread and anxiety, about the thin fires of braziers and meager hearths, until the night wore at last away and a new day of anxiety and dread had begun. It's gorgeous. It's so gorgeously written, and the entire book is like that. And like th this book is where I get my channel name from. Um, tomorrow and still tomorrow. It's I, I read that in my introduction video. Th this book just has so many gorgeous moments that I still can't get over to this day. And this book kind of haunts me. Um, the vibes in the language and the hap like the events in this book just stick to my mind and will not go away. And I think that's why I love this book so much. And I definitely think this one, unlike um, the Reavers, I, I definitely think this book deserved its Pulitzer Prize. So do I think you should read this book? No, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Because this book is an endeavor. This book is such an endeavor. It is long and slow and hard to read. This is honestly one of the harder books. I think it's harder than this um, because the plot is intentionally obfuscated at times. Don't read this book. Unless you're really dedicated, don't read it. You will you will suffer. <laughs> Unless you know what you're getting into, do not do it. You will you will suffer. But number three. <laughs> number two is a book that I think you should read. Even if you don't like Faulkner, read this book. Light in August. God, I love this book. Um, until I read a fable, this is the most beautifully written book I had ever read. Um, the, the prose in this book is so simple, but just luminescent. It, it, it's it's just beautiful. I don't know how to describe it really. Like whenever I was reading this book, I would get lost in the language because in, I think Faulkner has the best sentences in this book of any book that he's ever written that I've read at least. The rhythm and the flow of all of his sentences in the word choice. Let me just read a passage. Hold on. It began on that night. He believed that it was to go on for the rest of his life. At 17, looking back, he could see now the long series of trivial, clumsy, vain efforts born of frustration and fumbling and dumb instinct. The dishes she would prepare for him in secret and then insist on his accepting and eating them in secret when he did not want them and he knew that McEachern would not care anyway. The times when, like tonight, she would try to get her herself between him and the punishment which, deserved or not, just or unjust, was impersonal, both the man and the boy accepting it as a natural and inescapable fact until she, getting in the way, must give it an odor and attenuation in aftertaste. The, oh, this book. Um, so this book is about Joe Christmas. A, uh, a man who is very visibly white, but has black blood in him. Um, he's mixed race, even though he does not appear like that. And it's about him being like his mental anguish due to that. It's about his, his conflict and 
you know, the pain that he has to go through knowing that he is part black and knowing that like being living in a society that has conditioned him to think that black people shouldn't exist when he is part black. He has that blood in him, so he thinks that he should not exist himself. And this book is about the brutality and, you know, the the pain that racism causes to people, even those that, you know, you would seemingly think would get away and would benefit from the system. Um, it's, it's kind of about how dumb and frivolous and just dumb racism is in general and how that can lead to people dying, even though they, in any situation, they didn't deserve it. I also think this book has one of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, aside from tomorrow and still tomorrow. Um, this book, this quote I have to read is from um, Reverend Hightower talking to Byron Bunch. Um, I'm just gonna read it. They, the town people, are good people. They must believe what they must believe, especially as it was I who was at one time both master and servant of their believing. And so it is not for me to outrage their believing, nor for Byron Bunch to say that they are wrong, because all that any man can hope for is to be permitted to live quietly among his fellows. Number two. And number one is... The, the, this is my most biased pick, I'm going to be honest, because this is the book that got me into Faulkner and just reading in general as he lay dying. Um, this short baby is my favorite book of all time. Um, and yes, it's very sentimental. Um, like, there are very sentimental reasons for it being my favorite book of all time, but it is still my favorite book of all time and therefore at the top of this list. Um, this book is different because this is my mother's copy of this book. Um, I found this laying around while we were going through my mo mother's hoard of books that she has. Um, and I opened it to a random page and that page just happened to have six words on it. And those words were, my mother's a fish. And I read that and I was intrigued. I was like, what is this book? Why does it say my mother's a fish? That's the entire, that's that's all that's on the book or that's all, all, all that's on the page. And then it goes to the next chapter. So I read it and I fell in love with it. Um, it's such a gorgeous book. Um, and I think it's really summed up in what this line means and why this entire page is just six words. So this book is about um, Addie Bundren. She is a mother of a family, of a farming family, very poor, um, and she's dying. Uh, she has a fever, she's sick, she's just, you know, she's about to die. Um, and so her family are, is, are getting ready for her death and for her final wish, which is to be buried in um, her family graveyard, which is further into town. Um, so they have to get ready and, you know, hook her coffin to a wagon and drive her all the way into town, which is a multi-day endeavor. And so her family, you know, that would be a simple task if it weren't for the fact that her family are a bunch of dumbasses and are extremely dysfunctional by, and she's not excused from that. Addie herself has a chapter where she narrates and she's an asshole, but her family are awful to each other and to others. And so we kind of get to watch as this entire family goes through all of these different arcs. Um, so every chapter is narrated by um, somebody it has their own narration. Um, some it's the entirety of the family and some characters that aren't even a part of the family get narration like the Dr. Peabody gets a chapter early on. Um, and this is one of the greatest uses of multiple POV that I have ever read. Like, if you want to read a multi-POV, or if you want to write a multi-POV book, read this freaking novel. It is so good. This is how you do it. Because there's, like, so many different POVs, and it's a 242-page book. It's so well done. Um, but, like, a, a great, like, a great microcosm of why this book is so good is that six-word chapter. So, Vardaman is the youngest of the family. He is, his age is ambiguous, but he's somewhere around six to 10 years old. And he does not understand death because nobody has, you know, taken the time to explain it to him. Um, but his mother is dying and he doesn't understand why everybody is so 
caring for her and why Cash is building, a, his older brother is building a coffin. He doesn't understand anything, but he everybody keeps telling him to go play in the river or go play or just don't bother us right now because we're dealing with this. So he does and he goes to the river and finds a dead fish. And so he picks it up and starts playing with it. And he went, he goes back to the house and shows his brothers and sisters and his dad and his mom this dead fish that he found. And everybody's like, cool, Vardaman, go keep playing. And so when Addy does eventually die, Vardaman doesn't understand. And so they, you know, lock her and they put her in the coffin. They nail up the top and Vardaman freaks his shit because they just trapped his mother in this box. So he drills air holes for her and he tries talking to her with no response until he realizes that my mother is unmoving and unresponsive, kind of like that fish I found. That fish was dead. My mother is that fish, AKA my mother is dead. This entire chapter is Vardaman realizing what death is in six words. This is the reason why Faulkner is my favorite author of all time, is because he can do something like that in six words. This book is so much more complex too. That Stuff like that is done all over the place. All the characters are so complex, but it's all their stories are told with under 300 pages. It's just, this is a, this is a masterclass in brevity of you do not need to make a book longer than it like needs to be. This book could have been another 300 pages, but Faulkner didn't make it that because he knew what this book needed to be. 240 ish pages. And that was it. And that's kind of why uh, Eyes Lay Dying is my favorite Faulkner novel ever. So yeah. That is the ranking so far. I am currently reading The Hamlet, which is the first of three Snopes books. But so far, out of the 10 that I've read, this is my ranking. Um, I will, after I'm done reading all of his books, reread As They Lay Dying, just to kind of put a nice bow on top of the whole journey. But for the most part, I think these are all set in stone. Thank you guys so much for watching me ramble about Faulkner for nearly an hour, unedited, and probably going to be closer to 40, 30, 40 minutes. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, feel free to click the subscribe button and bell if you want to be notified whenever I upload. So yeah, hopefully this is an experiment that works. I don't, I, I don't know how this is going to go. Maybe I'll make another video. Maybe I'll never touch this channel again. We'll see. But uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys next time. Bye bye.